And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of Legacy Life Among the Ruins, along along with the along with the RPG end of um uh, of Mistea in the form of Shattered City. The one and only Douglas Mota. How you doing today, man? Pretty okay. Friday night. Excellent night for a bar yep. talk. So that's it. So one of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, as it were. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I, I know we talked. I know we talked about the Brazilian RPG scene um, a, a bit before we went live. But what was your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it um, stick for you? It was the like the most natural path. Uh, someone here in Brazil could take, like, do you know, remember, like, fighting fantasy books that yeah, started I think with... Yeah, I, I think I had one of those. Yeah, like, back in the 90s, that popped up here in Brazil, and it was very gradual. Like, something that started small, and I simply transitioned from more complex uh, 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 titles, the next one, and next, and before I could notice... I ended up with Shadowrun and Werewolf the Apocalypse in my hands and what the heck was I going to do with that? But we found some other crazy people and and from day one I was a I was a storyteller, I was a, a GM. And well, it's difficult to say what hooked me up, but pretty much everything. Uh, uh, it's something that if, to this day uh, it's a huge source of friendship of of stories of enthusiasm of of cool ideas of difficult questions it's something that is central to 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 my history let's say mm -hmm. now what's fun what's funny about that is that often i seem to be noticing a pattern when whenever i whenever i bring in game devs from from um brazil um, a lot of them seem to have gotten their start with World of Darkness. It's, um, I don't know if that's a case of just really convenient luck on my part, or if or World of Darkness really did have that large of a foothold in, at that time. Definitely. Um, bear in mind that we, Dungeons and Dragons, and at the time Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, uh, was released at almost, almost at the same time, I would say, from from the classic vampire uh the masquerade here so there was not that time of like that big of a transition from the the war gaming generation to the storytellers it was something that was like side to side so lots of people uh started in dungeons and dragons and at the same time they were playing uh the classic wood of darkness and a huge number of people never played Never started playing with Dungeons and Dragons in the first place, but instead uh, with Vampire the Masquerade. So yeah, I think it's 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 a strong trend here in Brazil, especially for those of us who are bilingual somehow or who get a grasp of English. Because first it showed up here in English, and only then it was translated. So uh, people who never had access to 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 English in the first place. They they enjoyed more like local games as we were speaking like in, in the warm up, uh, local games that were accessible, that were fun, that were fast, that were simple, and that had a lot of uh, uh, of reach in in like really young teenagers, 12, 13, 14 year old kids. So we have these tribes. Of, of games, gamers and designers in Brazil. When you say when you say tribes, I'm hope I'm hoping it's not I'm hoping it's not it's not a case of tribal conflict going on. <laughs> Absolutely not, really. Uh, it it was always very organic. Sometimes the, the the crowds didn't like weren't exactly the same, 
but we were never that many anyway to to really draw like exclusive lines everyone was traveling from one side to the other everyone everyone wanted, just wanted to play mm -hmm. and so there was no like this this ideas that you know this is good this is bad uh this is right this is wrong that was uh, at least from my experience it was not never something like uh strong or or that impacted the, the, the community as a whole yeah and with that in, with that in my, with that particular uh, thing in mind um I, the way you just the way you describe your early days it, it sounded like you went um more and more complex but i'm cur i'm curious where the shift happened where you for you where you started to um veer towards more rules light and more narrativist style games mm, nah from the beginning i was a lousy uh dungeons and dragons uh gm <laughs> i never used the full range of the the rules i feel as much as i could from the complexities of battle and like screw that let's let's tell it, uh, a cool story mm -hmm. so I think that from the beginning, uh, uh, I was narrative inclined, but the tools I had at the time were, were very limited. So, but I think one game, one game really shifted my attention to the potentials of, uh, uh, the potential of the games with a more narrative approach could have, and inspired me a lot in, in terms of looking for new stuff, different things. And when I started writing my own my own my own uh, games, it was always in my mind of like as, as a bar of excellence, especially if you considered when it was released. Castle Falkenstein, of all things, it was translated to Portuguese. Do, do you believe that? At the time, it was available here. So, in, in comparison to the other games, it, it, it was so different, so like out there. And it marked a lot my mind in, in, in the, the, the full potential of what games could be in terms of like ditch the rules, like ditch the details and get to the fun part of it, tell a cool story, be like less a game and more a, a literary approach to, to the game. Yeah, that's, de that's definitely something I, I can see. And um, how did you now... The two main things I know you by, of course, are Shattered City and Legacy Life Among the Ruins. Um, yeah. How did you first catch on with um, Powered by the Apocalypse? Um, something like 12 years ago, I got absolutely fed up with the what we called at the time the mainstream, like Dungeons and Dragons and Classic World of Darkness. Mm -hmm. no, but I mean, like, uh, I, I was having... Itches. We never. <laughs> I looked at the books like never again, never again, and <laughs> I started to drift and literally research games that were as distant as possible as as the the, the mainstream. So I ran the full range of different games, like tried, bought, played lots of different games, and one of the games that I bought. Interestingly enough, it was not Apocalypse World. It was Spirit of 77. And man, I had like so much fun with that. It's to this day is probably my, 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 my favorite PBTA, not only for the excellent job that they've done there, but because of the, the, the emotional, emotional connection, let's say, the, the, the history of it. Mm -hmm. I had a, a very small group, very tight. We played like tons of it over the course of six months and it like i was converted uh, that was it i was converted to pbta there and so converted i was that i wanted to okay that's that this is the moment i want to write i want to to publish something and this is the rule this this is the environment at the time we were uh, uh g plus was like a thriving community mm -hmm. I miss and, G plus. Yeah, it was great. I, I talked to like to so many people that published published great games. 
uh, there. And, and it was the right moment. Everything was aligned, so I decided, okay, I will go from a, a, a narrator, a, a GM, a player, a, 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 an enthusiast of their hobby to try to publish because this is the, the, this is the right environment for that. Yeah. And when it comes... Now, of, co of course, some... Um, Leg of course, legacy had co had come around first, and that's ki that's kind of going towards a um, a po a post apocalyptic bent. Was um was the main reason going going for that just um just due to starting out with apocalypse world or something like that, or what was the reason for going with that particular approach? No, uh, as as I mentioned, uh, it was a decision. I wanted to 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 publish something, so I had a, this kind of a plan. I will approach the games that I feel that have lots of potential and lots of room to to grow, and I will approach their authors and propose, like, make a a a, a job proposition, like this is a supplement a supplement that I could write to your game, and I made one page pitch. And sent emails to the authors of three games that are respected a lot at the time: um, Uncharted Worlds, uh, Tremulous, and Legacy. I was ready to to write for any one of these these three games. Uh, I felt that I could contribute, and that I was deeply impressed by by what they what they offered. And I had some, sorry, like some advances with with uh, one of these titles, especially with Tremblos. There was some, like the, the the author was forthcoming. Okay, let's let's talk about that. But at uh, Amina at the time was was more enthusiastic. Like, okay, let's see what you've got, and she was really uh, into what like uh, uh, liking the ideas. And we decided to go for a small supplement for the Legacy First Edition. So uh, it, it was one of the choices I had, but I always liked a lot sci fi and, and uh, post apocalyptic fiction, fiction. Yeah. And now, what I do, fi what I do find interesting about the, about the particular take on post-apocalypse that you were go that you go with is having an emphasis on rebuilding um mm -hmm. was was that was was that a case of wanting to do post-apocalypse but do something that hadn't really been touched on mm -hmm. more i think it was a more of a personal inclination much more related to that than simply uh, a game that that was original, it it, it, it spoke to me li like more deeply. Uh, I'm a, I'm a child from the '80s and the '90s, so the Cold War, it was like that childhood memory that was there, like was really there. Um, the '90s, like the the, the things that the, the feeling that things were rebuilding my personal life we have had like several um, moments of loss personal material things happened and I would always see my family very like like very focused on this you take your heads you don't bow your head you look ahead and you rebuild yeah like no nonsense. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. How bad is the situation? It doesn't matter. We rebuild. We deal with it. Yeah. Um, so it was only natural. Well, honestly, it was only natural uh, that Legacy and Shattered City deal with these these issues so closely. It's it's for me at least from from my side of it was it was only natural. Mm -hmm. And when now before before I get into sh before I get into Shattered City, um, 
one thing that one thing that I did want to touch on is when now obviously obviously whenever somebody works on a um, cer- on a certain system they're it's they're usually looking at cer- at um what they can ex- at what they can expand upon what were were th- were there certain things within the um, framework of powered by the apocalypse that you that you thought could be that you thought could be expanded upon or could be refined yes of course mm-hmm. because part of the apocalypse offers such a robust framework sometimes you feel that it's less a, a rule system and more of a philosophy like a, a guiding principle so of course there is plenty of room to 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 not necessarily to improve but to add, mm-hmm. to build upon, to reassemble, to evolve. Yeah, that's the feeling I have with the system. That's why, uh, man, let's say well, Legacy, between Legacy, Second Edition, and Engine of Life, and Endgame, I wrote 20-something new family and, and character playbooks. And a lot of them have novel, uh, uh, new new systems, particular to that family, particular to that character. And all of them are contained, can be expressed within the, the, the apocalypse system. Mm-hmm. So it, it is exactly this room to grow, this, this, this agility to maneuver, this flexibility that makes the system so, so, so important. In, in the game design scene nowadays, yeah. Um, and in that in that regard, um, what were some of what were some of the big takeaways and some of the big learning experiences you had from first to second edition of Legacy? Okay, from the first to the second, this that that people had wanted. To, to build their own worlds. We all know that the, the part about the apocalypse systems, they, they have this, this flexibility. It, they don't never really talk about the, the, the scenario in death. It's, it's not like that. Your, your, your team, your, 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 your players, they, they collaborate, they mention, things start in, in the action and then details of the, the scenario show up, history is, is written and etc. Mm-hmm. But with Legacy Second Edition, it was so clear that, and, and I have several players and playtesters that, that have always told me that, that their favorite part was always the world building. The, the tools that we developed to, to build their own worlds and histories and backgrounds, uh, it was solid. And that that commitment that came with building this this rich, this flavorful, this deep scenarios would engage people into the the, the chronicles, into the game uh, on the on the not only on the short term mm-hmm. but also on the medium and long long term. Yeah. So that's that's for me was the main uh, main takeaway. Yeah. Um... And that br- that brings me to um, sh- that brings me to Shattered City. Yes. Now, when it came now, of course, when I was doing research on it originally, I had just known Shattered City as the RPG itself. That was how I got introduced to it, and mm-hmm. it wasn't until later that I found out that there are that there were other properties um, within the Mistheia setting, um, a board game, and a few and a few other um, items. And what I'm curious about is, was it was it a case where you were approached to do something in this setting, or were you, or did you have a hand in the creation of the Mistia setting as well? No, it was again uh, the case of me uh, playing the peddler, the 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 the, the, the salesperson, like the, uh, and approaching them. Mm-hmm. And again, them and um, all the like brilliant board games that had beautiful uh, uh, art and and uh, 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 a setting with lots of potential. 
Uh, so I approached uh, Tabla Raza uh, 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 team and proposed like, okay, we would like to, to write uh, an RPG game for your, in your setting, connecting that to the, to the board game. And it was a grand experiment. It was an idea that we, it, it was itching in my mind that what if, how much overlap is there uh, between the, the, the board game crowd and uh, the RPG game uh, uh, crowd? Uh, how much will it transfer from one to the other in terms of numbers? How many people will get interested in one end to the other? Mm -hmm. It is interesting to know that the Magpie team, I think one year later or even less than that, had a huge success with Root. Meaning they saw the same potential. There is this art, there is this implied uh, lore, there is this visual identity, mm -hmm. and let's let's bring it over. Let's let's uh, uh, bridge it to the, the RPG games, and there they had more like the the success of, of their of their Kickstarter was was jaw dropping was excellent, and it is something that we we tried even before that, and wanted to achieve similar results. Let's say, yeah. Um. And when it now when it came to um, when it came when it came to Shat, when it came to Shattered City, how did the kernel of that idea come about? Well, that's it came about with the from the challenge of working with an intellectual property mm -hmm. that was the Mystica Universe, and there were some things that I couldn't touch, of course. Yes, there had some elements that I had to use. And, okay, now what? How can I work with these pieces, with these parts? Um, and there was no easy answer for that. It was not something that we came into the project knowing how, how we would deal with that. So they proposed the, 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 the parameters. Don't touch this. You have to use that respect these boundaries, present the rest to us, and we will prove it or not. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of teamwork and back and forth, like fine-tuning the ideas. At the time, uh, I was presented by, by Mina and the Kickstarter as the lead designer, mostly because she was involved, involved with Void, uh, Void Heart Symphony. Yep. And uh, Miss Thea and Shattered uh, City, it was mine mind to play with. So the core concept of the city and the borderlands, the core concept of the occupation, of the struggles, of a th uh, uh, the, the local people uh, struggling to, to try to maintain their identity, regain their liberty, the difficult choices, the political gain, the, the, together with the, this looming war that was like all consuming all of these were choices that I made to have some freedom to work, keep the stakes high, explore the concepts of the, the, the setting to the, like, to the best of my abilities, and offer something that would be at once marvelous because the setting is, is weird fantasy at its best. Mm -hmm. People really get that like, wow, feeling like, and, and they, they get surprised, it, it, it touches people with wonder. And, but we needed also very like grounded, very human um, points of view to, to connect people to, to this huge fantasy setting that they were presenting. Mm -hmm. So they came as, as from this interaction, from, from the limitations, the, this, what I had in hand, and how can we make a human game out of a such alien and beautiful scenario? Yeah, and um, when it comes now, you had mentioned earlier. You had mentioned earlier that um, when it came to when it came to legacy, a good a good 
chunk of inspiration was that whole Cold War era um, youth. What were what were some of the inspirations um, to do a, to do a um, fantasy approach with fa with Shattered City? Hmm. Okay, let's get back to legacy. Mm -hmm. Legacy is post apocalypse, right? Yes. But what are exactly the limits of this of this post apocalypse? Um, uh, 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 definition because I have and I kid you not uh, uh, we have like played 10 12 different uh, campaigns of legacy over the course of years between play test and play test and play test and having lots of fun and process what I saw is that legacy is as much as a sci-fi game as a, as it is a, a post-apocalypse it is broad it is really broad um, especially with the new playbooks, each and every new playbook would, would add, add different angles. And this definition of post-apocalypse was time and again tested to brush shoulders very closely to, to, to sci-fi as a whole. Mm -hmm. So, as far as genres go, like big ones, we had we had the possibility of doing what like an oh um creative space horror well terror nina went for that in 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 void heart symphony that that urban fantasy that that touch of of terror uh the, the the weird fiction not weird fancy but the weird fiction it is all present it's all there so fantasy was the next uh, uh obvious uh territory to expand let's say to to claim by forest <laughs> yeah to grasp so it, it was a very logical a very natural approach what else can we do with this this engine that is running so well Okay, let's do something like Orb. So she went to, for for Void Heart Symphony, and I looked at okay, fantasy. Fantasy can be uh, an excellent uh, uh, choice. Mm -hmm. Now, the main the I can def I can definitely get that. Um, when it when it came to what I'm also curious about is what um. What meet what media provided the inspiration for that particular um, the particular style of fantasy that you guys went with? Um, like what like what were what were you reading, watching, or or the like that kind that kind of put that kind of put ideas in your head about it? That's that's kind of easy. Uh, okay, TV shows like for me, mm -hmm. I understand that me and I added. Um, to the, to the final manuscript she added the reference that she thought were relevant as well but for me three shows um, were very strong references Rome from HBO mm -hmm. um, but especially Marco Polo and Da Vinci Demons that that feeling especially Marco Polo that feeling of different civilizations under the same roof the, 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 the clash of the, there's nothing exotic there. Everyone is different. Everything is is foreign. Everything is is unique yet inserted on, under the same uh, context. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was a, a big inspiration. For the part of magic, for the part of the mysticism of of the the strangeness of the scenario. Well, that's that's a little bit harder because that's where the the inspiration came from the the, the good intellectual property that we we chose. Mm -hmm. uh, the board game they, it, it gave hints. Like sometimes I would take a, one card, and I remember that it was that like one card, uh, nothing, a, a sentence, a small sentence in the piece of art, and I would would extrapolate from there. So, and there was a lot 
to 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 build on, on that framework that they 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 had came up with of course their lore is the lore um, the, the the perfect size for a board game meaning is there to color the experience yeah but there was a lot to 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 influence us as well and besides that most likely something that was ingrained in my subconscious since Giant, like teenager years, it was Dark Over series from Marzino Broadly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, before we 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 knew and uh, uh, of the problems associated with her image, etc. But of course, the, the the memory was there. The use of crystals, the the, the circles of people acting together, mm -hmm. the, the the connections of emotions with magic. It, it, it bears it bears a strong uh influence even though it was distances was fundamental it was there. it's part of my of my fictional uh, database in a very strong way yeah and we yeah. don't mention her in the book we don't want to 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 uh to give her any any visibility on that given the, the what we've learned later of, of her actions but I, I can't. I can't simply, honestly, say that it wasn't a, an inspiration. It was, of course. Mm -hmm. And like when, when a lot of a lot of times when I would sh when when um when I would sh when I would show um something like Shat something like Shattered City or de or delve into it, um one of the t the um one of the main things that all that always struck am amongst a lot of people and i'm cu i'm curious if this um on your take on this is the um depiction of is the depiction of fantasy which as you as you mentioned you're leaning more towards um weird fantasy now for me in the states when i think of we when i think of weird fiction i'm often thinking of the um pulp stories from the 20s um mm -hmm. Maybe a, maybe a little bit of the fifties, but most but mostly the stuff that was in weird tales way back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. When now, give, given how, given how you meant you mentioned that um, you were never a good um, dungeon master, was there a was? I'm not saying that this was an intent, but was there a little bit of a uh, a mindset of not wanting to do the traditional fantasy trappings? Definitely. Um, let's say I probably read Michael Moorcock mm -hmm. before I read Tolkien. That says it all. That 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 <laughs> really. Uh, and that's over. Next question. That's it. <laughs> what 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 can I say? That's 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 true. Uh, 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 Eric. And not only Eric, uh, the Eternal Champion. Uh, mm -hmm. oh. From one scene to the next, the, the, the grand scope of, of what he wrote. And the next page, you would like to say, damn, this is brilliant. This realm is destroyed. Gone. Next page. Someone else. And what? Ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, definitely. When I talk about weird fiction, mm -hmm. Um, I didn't read, of course, only Michael Moorcock, but it, it, it is the, the, the key factor, the, the, the culprit, probably. And I read a lot of other authors that can be called magical realism or, 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 or weird fiction besides the typical pulp, um, tales that inspired so much of the RPG scenes in the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. Uh, 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 George Luis Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, Argentinian author. Okay, he never mentions anything explicitly f like sword and sorcery. Uh, uh, uh. But if you read him, if you read his takes, if you read about his libraries, the, the use of mirrors, the 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 the, the references to book that never existed, 
these kind of things, they are deeply in, in shattered CD mm -hmm. DNA. We're very well disguised, very, it would take a very good test to find them, but they, they were part of my inspiration as, as well. Yeah. And more outside, like authors outside of the, the US, big 20s pulp uh, movement, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, you, it's um, def it's definitely in definitely interesting when when it comes to when it comes to that one. And um, part of the part of the reason that the whole weird fantasy thing always um, st always stri always sticks with me is I uh, now I'm not I'm not going to say I'm as seasoned as you are, but I've I've been around the block a few times and. I um I distinctly remember seeing forum arguments about um Planescape and whether or not Planescape should count as fantasy because it was quote unquote too weird. Oh. Planescape? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's 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 the best thing that happened to Dungeons and Dragons. Really. <laughs> Definitely that's it. That was the first, not the first, but what, uh, a scenario that I that I uh, the GM'd, but it was the second, the third, the fourth, and the favorite. Yeah, uh, I started with Dark Sun. Okay, cool, not too bad, interesting. I had a rules copilot that would help me with this this boring game part of the game, <laughs> but when it came to to Planescape, no, it's 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 a beauty. It's a did, beauty. It, did you it ever deserve it so much more? Did you ever mess around with Spelljammer back in the day? Ah, okay, yeah, cool, interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that the the one time that it caught my eye, it was in a hack for the third edition, I guess, in which the guy included a lot of art novel um, images to 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 Spelljammer. Mm -hmm. That was the only moment I looked at it. Ha, ah, okay. That really interest picked my, my attention, but I never managed to play. But it wasn't really something that really wanted to 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 explore. Yeah, I can I can get I can um, get that. Um... Gifts, man, really gifts. Gifts. <laughs> uh, they make everything harder. Gifts. <sighs> Uh, okay, let's get back to Planescape. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for, I this is this is honestly this is honestly why I think that it's it, it's it's always interesting seeing a um, seeing a kind seeing a kind of introduction to role playing that doesn't have um, the more traditional base. I guess I'll say because. Mm -hmm. um, I've often what I've often wondered, and, may, and maybe this is something that's been that's been brought up on, on your end as well. That would something like Planescape or the like be considered too weird if people didn't have this assumption that the very British approach that that is seen in um um Tol in Tolkien's work, if they didn't see that as the default kind of approach to doing high fantasy. That gest that gestalt of it, and that's that's probably why the that's probably why the worst thing that you the worst way to introduce somebody to role playing is to have them start with D and D, <laughs> which I know is blasphemy, but I'm not going I'm not going to repent that. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's put it like that. Michael McCork, British too, right? Am I wrong? I don't think so. No. Yeah, He's British, but British. I would, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, class. I would say Elric is more Slavic than it is um, British. But it's high fantasy. It is yes. deeply high fantasy. Oh, it de it definitely is, and I think that so it's all there. Yeah, it's <laughs> sorry, it's, def it's definitely there. But um, I guess I think. I think an I think an excellent case in point when it comes to when it comes to that whole people not people um not want not wanting to do just the 
just the very British Tolkien pastiche is um, the popularity of the Witcher video games nowadays. Which, um, even though that is high fantasy, I'd hardly call that British. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's vi it it's vi and yeah, there's the argument that the original author plagiarized Moorcock, but um, for a lot, but for a whole generation, that was. Uh, it was it was a type of fantasy that wasn't British. It was more homegrown, which I think is the reason why I was able to establish a foothold. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the thing with all of that is that th is that what I what I see with Shattered City and what I see elsewhere is that fantasy can take many forms. Not just not just fantasy as a whole, but even high fantasy can take many forms. One doesn't have to um, conform to the to the Tolkien melting pot, as I've called it. Definitely not. Uh, yeah, it's it's so little. We. we RPG gamers, mm -hmm. writers, designers, we created this, this, this overgrowth around the, the, the Tolkien's fiction. Dungeons and Dragons created that. They tried to, to bring it to order, like Dark Sun, for example, it was an excellent effort in, in, in looking into what fantasy could be and pushing the boundaries, especially when you go into the lore how things came to be that like when you look at beyond the, the basics of the setting mm. and uh, a more global view it was pretty audacious really it was something out of the box it was interesting but on the other hand how many different novels have we read that were pretty much overgrowth like developments like the same but with a different approach let's make it more modern let's make it more modern mm -hmm. and if if dungeons and dragons um generated willingly or otherwise consciously or not this overgrowth it also tried to expand into that every new edition brought new species into the fold like uh, races as basic player races mm -hmm. every one of these new guys made like uh, and i will go a little bit major the ascension here uh, uh reshaped the paradigm yeah when you when you add a tiefling to a base like a core book you 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 go a little bit further away from from talking when when you have a, a these differences, different races, a, a, a three king, uh, like the more exotic ones, mm -hmm. that's when people start to to grow, to to think outside of the box and to to experiment. And if honestly, if you look into what people have been playing and what people have been not only on tabletop games but also in video games, etc. You will see that the, the, it's a mess nowadays. For people who grew up with elves and dwarves, nowadays you look around to, to game parties and what is this menagerie? What is the, like, what are, what are you? <laughs> and, and that's not a bad thing. No. Because it's bringing, like, it's breaking the, the calcified elements of, of, uh, of fantasy. And, and from there, new, better, more, 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 more daring uh, fantasy and fiction will 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 come for will, will come into existence. So I'm grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And when it now, when it comes to when it comes to um, when it comes, if somebody now I want to I want to throw a bit of a hypothetical aside from one being fantasy and one being um. One being post-apocalyptic. If someone was, if someone, how seamless of a jump would it be, genre shift aside, for someone who had been been messing around with um, legacy to jump into um, Shattered City? 
it would feel natural. It would feel natural. Um, because exactly the, the, the main thing that newcomers uh, uh, have to deal with, the, the main different thing that they have to deal with in legacy is the, that relation between character, family, ages. You control a family, you control a character that belongs to a family across ages, meaning that your family is the main, is the central uh, is your is your central character, let's say. That the heroes they come and go, they build the history, but the family is is the is the backbone of it all. This shift in 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 perception, this shift in protocol even in, in, in how you play around this. This is the main challenge for, for in my experience for new legacy players. Mm -hmm. And that is it it's all there in, in, in Shattered City. So the shift wouldn't be too jarring. It would be it would feel natural. Maybe even more even like more comfortable because the, the time frame of Shattered City is of a more controlled uh, uh, approach. It is more uh, uh, a zoom in in uh, the history of the planet. It is more like the boundaries are more like the well defined. So they would transit really well. Some of the characters, some of the the families. I think that the overall feeling would be ah, this is an evolution of legacy with a different skin, with a fantasy skin like hundreds of hours of play test and we a chance to refine the systems what is it working what 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 is it that what system is is the proud nail mm -hmm. in, in legacy look at that define that how can i make it better this was applied to shattered city so they wouldn't feel that much of a difference and the difference that they would see beyond, of course, the the, the genre, the, the 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 skin, would be the, greeted with this feeling of evolution. Is more streamlined, is safer in the meaning of uh, more controlled. The, the fiction has a, a, a more, it's more focused. You have more like a more clear path to to your history. Mm -hmm. So I think it would, they would transit really well from one to the other. That was the objective from the start. Yeah, I can I can definitely make I can definitely um, make sense out of that, make sense out of that. Um, when it now when it comes to one thing one thing I did one thing I definitely did notice is. And and this is pro this is probably due to the uh, fantasy background that you have is the f is the fact that within within a lot of the playbooks that Shattered City has there's there's not there's not a as much of a hard as much of a hard line between um between more magic affiliated uh, or more supernaturally affiliated um heroes and one and ones that are a little bit le a little bit less so I e there isn't and some some of this is due to um, part of the apocalypse systems, I'm sure. But you don't have that dividing power. You don't have that dividing line between people who can use magic and people who can't. Mm -hmm. um, was that another one of those um, th things from traditional fantasy that you just didn't care for? Um, funny. Okay. Because as you were saying, this this layer of uh, the families and the characters without that much of a niche protection, mm -hmm. uh, they are they are all more 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 uh, versatile than that. If you want to have a building a build of a certain family or character that is more martial oriented, more social oriented, or more mystical oriented you can make it like all of them were built to be flexible they were built to give you how do you want to play that of course a few of them are more inclined into that you can make a martial character out of a out of a warlock let's say you can of course 
But as you evolve, chances are that you will, of course, lean uh, uh, into the direction of something more musically oriented. And the funny thing is, it came from a game that is very much traditional fantasy. Mm -hmm. Francesco's ne Francesco Nepitello's The One Ring. It's um, it's fun, funny you mentioned that because I I I covered The One Ring last month. Um, mm -hmm. Really, I'm hoping against hope that somebody will get the license so we can actually get that second edition of it. But um, we'll see. But I was I was really bummed out when that thing ended up um, ended up disappearing. Yeah, as a game designer. Is it's one of the most impressive games I have seen, and especially in the last decade, it is like big traditional games. It is one of the jewels in terms of elegance. It, it deals with so many issues that so many other games have stumbled upon and have like tried to just follow suit either World of Darkness or 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 Dungeons and Dragons, and it carved its own path and it's. It's not perfect. It's not meant to be perfect. It's no. meant to capture the spirit of Tolkien's uh, 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 work, but it does that with such an elegance. I, like uh, uh, I try to write, I look up to that with a little bit of hatred because I know I won't get as good as <laughs> I something. Won't do a I job think <laughs> I think one thing that worked in the One Ring's favor is unlike mo unlike almost every other. Um, Tolkien RPG that I've seen that I've seen, and I'm talking ones that are explicitly designed to emulate Tolkien, not Tolkien adjacent stuff. Is they all ha they all were bu were built on a different foundation. Um, mm -hmm. Merp way back in the day was built was built as a simpler version of Rollmaster. Um, the Deci the Decipher game was built on a modified version of the uh, of the CODA system that was used for the Star Trek RPG that Decipher had made. Mm -hmm. um, the One Ring, the um, Lord of the Rings adventure game that um, Iron Crown had done was tried to be was to try and be an even simpler version <laughs> of Merp. And it's, it was too complicated. Go on. Um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say it was too complicated. The um, I do think I do think that, um, I do think that Ro I do think that Rollmaster is a very um, '80s ver kind of game. Um, mm. By that, by that I mean I'm not sure when this transition happened, but at some, but um, in the early days of the R of the RPG, we talked about earlier the tr the that whole war gaming and role playing relationship. If you look at game design in um, wargaming, the mechanics are very segmented. It's, ve it's very, mm -hmm. here's a set of mechanics for this particular event, here's a set of mechanics for this particular event, and so on. I'm not sure when this happened, but as time went on, it started to become less of, less of a series of sub-mechanics and more of a all-roads-lead-to-Rome approach. Um, I'll use World of Darkness as, as an example for this. With the storyteller system, all roads lead to that um, D10 die pool, that success-based set of D10s. There isn't any, there isn't any sort of alternate type of role that's only used in these in specific circumstances. No, it all is within that within that kind of dice. Um, roll and um, rollmaster is in that older um, camp. Um, the one. Ri the One Ring ki is kind of situational, but not nearly as much as a lot of um, game a lot of games in the '80s and '90s could be. Um, especially that Aliens R RPG, with not the not the one that came out recently. I'm talking the one that came that came out almost 20 years ago, that no one wants to play. Mm -hmm. That like that's that's where you get the examples of overly crunchy. Um, mm -hmm. But I think th I think the biggest the 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 thing that the thing that I'm nef I'm definitely not going to forget when it comes to the One Ring's design is how it handled traveling. Beautiful, because um, a, a lot of times, and you've you've probably seen this yourself when it comes to 
traveling from set from settlement to dungeon or between settlements or what have you, it's treated as a montage moment. Mm-hmm. Instead, instead of a part, instead of a part of the actual thing, even with even with hex crawls, it's um like in in old school hex crawls that I've played, it's still somewhat montagey. And and the the events is just a case of rolling die and, che- and checking a chart and not much else, which is fine. But I think but it's one of those things where you feel like you can do bet that people can do better. Yeah. Uh, it, it this is something that we call, and uh, when I mean we, it's just my group of friends, nothing else. Uh, we call arenas of play, meaning a game. What does this game give attention to? Um, most games, especially the older ones, they give a lot of attention to the, the, the rule book is centered about the idea of combat. And okay, this is how you deal with social issues and how you jump over a cliff and how you do other stuff. But you know that this is just an add-on. The central issue, the central uh, 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 purpose of this of this system was to manage combat. This is clear in a, in a variety of, of different um, games. Mm-hmm. Some of them they 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 masquerade that in different like okay, you are not just swinging a sword at someone, you are swinging your program at the ice software. In the in the matrix, yeah, it's a still combat. It's a still the same the same mindset of combat, just applied to a different kind of kind of uh, uh, kind of conflict. But when you have a game that has combat and magic, and the magic goes beyond simply dealing damage or protecting from damage, and really goes into what magic can do, okay, that's a second arena of play. Over the course of time, lots of games have added like the social arena as okay, its own like subsystems, its own means, its own feeling. It's different from combat, or it is the same thing as combat with different stakes. Reasonable. Mm-hmm. The beauty of the One Ring is that it, it it puts at the same level of of importance, relevance, and. Uh, to the not only to the players but to the narrators to the game itself, combat, social, um, and and especially traveling. And there's so many things that Nick Devil did right in, in in the one ring. Not only him, of course, his whole whole team. But uh, it is a game that is uh, it, 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 honestly, for me at least, is uh, I find it brilliant. Lots of lessons to be learned. It of course influenced, as you observed, the flexibility of playbooks and 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 families and heroes. What do you want to play? Do you really need to be divided by the guy that beats people up, the guy that talks to people, the guy that leads the tra- leads the travel? Everyone can be somehow can do it somehow. And we give people like different ways you can achieve result in the, the each one of these different arenas of play yeah and what now uh, when it comes to when it comes to that whole notion of arenas at play what i'm what i'm curious about is where is um where where would you have the defining lie about what counts as an arena of play and what would count as a subtype of an arena what would count as separate arenas of play in that regard Huh. That's an interesting question and a difficult one. Um, I know that during Shattered, like while well, I wrote Mythia and Shattered City, slash Shattered City, is that um, combat was a small part of it. Um, I wanted really to add the part of travel as something important. I wanted really to people to have a more um, evolved form of, of politics in the in the personal level and in the like community level, let's say. And then definitely wanted the, the way people deal with magic to feel unique, mm-hmm. 
So maybe this is the key, the key word. And I'm, I'm um, really, I'm taking, I'm talking something, it's not a developed notion, something that I thought before, but this is perhaps the, the key notion that it feels unique. You may be using the same subset of systems, but you feel you're doing something different, different stakes, different pace uh, uh, at the table. Mm -hmm. So there was one example of that that was uh, very interesting. That in, in Ishatarad City, there is one move that is very unusual for, for one of many unusual moves for Powered by the Apocalypse. One that, that allows you to travel from point A from point B, areas that you, have un, that you don't have it mapped. And I remember that during the, the, the conversations, like uh, me and I read that, and this move, it's, it doesn't feel right. And why? Because you might have end, ending up to roll twice to reach a place. And yes, but if you roll it twice, it means that you tamed the path, you carved the path, you, 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 you just didn't went into the wilds, reach the other side and you can, back, can come back safely. No, you, you, it takes effort, but it's too difficult. It's, it's not like, it doesn't work like that. No, I mean, well, it kind of does. How, how many times have you like really tried to go track into the wild like for three four five days in a region that you have some landmarks a map maybe and even though you you got lost you found found things you never expected to you found people that you never expected to find it there yeah and by chance uh, 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 i had just spent like five days in in doing a, a track in, in, in the Brazilian, uh, uh, we call Cerrado, like hinterlands, like the savanna, the, 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 the deep heart of Brazil. Like we spent five days getting like uh, 45 kilometers at a good pace, enjoying, but hiking, camping. And we had the maps and we had the landmarks and it wasn't easy at all. Imagine if you go into those wilds without any sort of map diving like head first without much of a preparation it is hard it is an endeavor it is not something like a swing of a sword that you that you or a battle that you quickly resolve you know this is what i'm talking about this difference this difference in pace and feeling you know you are not just fighting on the different stakes on the different uh under different skin mm -hmm. it is something different that's Blurred line, that's it. That's what I look for. Yeah, I can I can definitely see I, that's something I can definitely see. Um now with the with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, what what is the what does the future hold for your your respective projects? Like what like what do you see what do you see yourself working on down the line? I know that I know things have been kind of chaotic with the with the worst year ever, trademark pending. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm curious. But I'm curious what I'm curious what you've been wor what you've been working on um, most recently. Okay, uh, I think that the, the my partnership with you uh, for press has reached the point of that we can. Okay, it was good. Really, we, we really developed good stuff so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm proud of what we've done with Legacy. Um, I'm really conscious about like my the like my contribution to the to the whole of the project. Mina was just, of course not only the creator, but for a good part of it was very mindful uh, uh, editor, someone that really had an oversight and and tweaked things and would challenge me in some aspects. So I have lots to thank to thank her for but I, th I feel everyone has been there professionally I feel that it's time that new partnerships should be explored so uh, I'm not ruling out writing for legacy in the future something additional and a new supplement I don't know yet of course ideas I have is still like a, a, a good amount of ideas one or two books that could be condensed like two, that could be developed 
um, I don't know if I will really uh, dedicate myself to that. Uh, I've churned, like I've, 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 we came from like second edition. I was producing, uh, writing down for Engine of Life, End Game, and then Miss Thea in a, like a very uh, uh, constant pace. Last six months, I. Uh, I'm taking a, a well-deserved rest, I would say. Um, this is not my primary profession. That's my, like, something that I do in my free time. Mm -hmm. uh, I work offshore uh, in the oil industry, and during this pandemic, we are working much more than the usual there. Like, we're staying more than um, sometimes 35, 40 days offshore and just 10 days at home. So it has been really exhausting. So I'm so far, I have ideas, projects, but most likely they won't. Uh, uh, they won't be anything with Ufa Press for now. They might talk about legacy in the future. I have really the, the wish to write. I've started writing, but it's one of those things that you, uh, I, I didn't s like start at the high gears yet, but a hard sci-fi game a game that does hard sci-fi without being traveler, without being bogged down in so many uh, rules that are so similar. I love Eclipse Phase. It's the best sci-fi setting ever, really. I, I, I love sci-fi and Eclipse Phase live, like, I adore that. But the system, uh, we are, we play narrativistic games nowadays. So I think that my, my main research uh, is, is going this direction, like a hard sci-fi game, uh, a game that explores hard sci-fi uh, concepts pretty much in the revelation space from Alastair Reynolds' uh, 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 work, but with rules that, that bring the feeling of a narrativistic game, a narrativist game to the table. My, my main objective is to write a game that brings the feeling that you have during a world building of a legacy game or a Shattered City game to like almost constantly as you go, as you explore a session. And again, not like 100% of that, but you, you have the same pleasure, but not only in the first session, but more present, more like... Uh, organized, streamlined over the course of the, the, the future uh, games. That's what I am at at the moment. Yeah, I, get, I, I can certainly get that. And regardless of how, regardless of how that turns out after the, after that um, vacation, which I can I can relate to that because my co my colleagues have been tr have been trying to talk me into taking some kind of a, some kind of vacation simply because of my output. <laughs> um but it's one it's uh, it's something I'll definitely be looking forward to um no matter how no matter how it um how it how it turn how it turns out and I w and when that when that comes around I I will w I will wish you all the best um but with that in mind I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say, drinking is, not, drinking is not mandatory around here, but it is encouraged. Very much appreciated. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks to everyone for taking the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs> <laughs>